Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the ASAP Pathway Podcast. I'm your host today, Dr. Stacy, and I am thrilled, honored to have our guest today, Patrick McKeown. Did I say it right? McKeown? Absolutely. Okay. That sounds really, really good. <laughs> okay. You're Irish, right? Mm -hmm. I've got I had, I've had, a, got... I had a D. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I had my DNA done just before Christmas. Well, somebody actually gave it to me as a birthday present. And I suppose when you're hitting that age of five zero, this is where you start getting interested in this kind of stuff. So yeah, the results were eighty six percent Irish and fourteen fourteen oh. percent Scottish. Oh my so goodness! A bit of a Scott thrown in there you're... as well. Okay, so all right, I'm just gonna totally crash this whole thing here and just let's talk about our DNA for a second. <laughs> I had DNA testing, you know, the little you know uh, ancestry mm. DNA. We always knew there was a lot of Irish in our family. So mine came back 30% Irish. Wow. And uh, and then some other stuff. I, I didn't even know I was Swedish and it came back like 20% Swedish. But the my grandma, my great grandmother, she always said, you're Scott Irish. I don't know what that means. Does that mean something when someone says, no, but you're Scott Irish? What's that mean? There was a lot of travel, it, you know, Scotland and Donegal, which is placed in the north side of Ireland. And the distance is very, very short. So there was a lot of travel, a lot of okay. Irish people traveling over to Scotland and Scottish people coming over here. So, you know, I think there's a, that's why I suppose we always felt a, a very good allegiance towards um, Scotland. Okay. Well, then my grandma was very like, if I would say, grandma, you know, we're Irish, right? She'd say, you're Scott Irish. And I'm like, oh, okay. I just, she always corrected me. Well, let me introduce Patrick to everybody. For those of you um, who may not know Patrick McKeown, um, he's one of the world's leading experts on breathing. This is going to be an exciting conversation because this is, a, to me, the missing piece of the puzzle on so many levels. Over the last 20 years, he has coached thousands of people to breathe better, to improve their health, mental focus, and sports performance. He has authored best-selling books, including Asthma Free Naturally, Close Your Mouth, The Oxygen Advantage, The Breathing Cure, and most recently, Atomic Focus. And his research is published in journals, including the Journal of Clinical Medicine. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology in the UK for his contribution to the fields of breathing and sleep medicine. He's the founder of Buteco Clinic International, the largest Buteco breathing clinic in the world. In 2014, he created his own science-backed breathwork program, Oxygen Advantage, which continues to develop in line with his clinical experience as a breathing coach and with the latest scientific research. He's trained thousands of breathing instructors in both methods. His work extends to the development of several patented products that support the practice of optimal breathing in adults and children. These include Myotape, the only lip tape that does not cover the mouth. That's the only one I even recommend, by the way. I love that one. Um, way less intimidating for people. And uh, if they had to breathe through their mouth, they could. A regular guest at speaker events and on popular health and fitness podcasts, Patrick has been featured by TEDx and by online publications, including USA Today, Mind Body Green, and Men's Health. He's passionate about conveying the importance of breath therapy and traditional health care and sports medicine. And he's committed to communicating his knowledge and breaking down barriers that prevent an accessible, holistic, empowering approach to well being and performance. Welcome, Patrick. It's a pleasure, Dr. Stacy. Thanks very much. And that's uh, listening to that is a little bit embarrassing in terms of the rigmarole with somebody's <laughs> bio. I have to have a shorter one up, up there on that website. No, this is this is wonderful. And I think. People need to understand who you are and how passionate you are. Um, before I even jumped on with you today, I was watching um, a YouTube video. You're giving a presentation, I think, uh, promoting your most recent book, um, Atomic Focus. And um, I think you're speaking to some um, business uh, business people in the audience. And it was just such an, an interesting uh, discussion, interesting talk. And I'm sitting there shaking my head going, yes, yes, yes. I think as a, a we have a whole uh, array of people listening um, to the podcast. We have healthcare professionals. Um, and when we have lay people, we have parents, we have patients. 
I think what I must have this conversation two to three times a day with my patients. When I pull up a CBCT and I see huge deviated septums or um, I'm watching them mouth breathe in my chair, huge adenoids in children, chapped lips, uh, bedwetting, all kinds of things in our health histories. You have a whole story as to why you even got on this journey. What on earth got you into this nose breathing is important mouth breathing is bad for us because patients don't get it. When I have this conversation, they just, it's the first time they're hearing it. So what's your, what's your story? Why, why is this so passionate for you? Oh, I, I don't think anybody is <clears throat> going to reach their full potential if they're persistently mouth breathing. I was that child. I was that teenager into my early adult and nobody, no healthcare professional ever said, Patrick, breathe in and out through your nose. And you know what? It's still beggars belief that 22 years later, there's still that lack of awareness there. And if you are persistently mouth breathing, of course, during childhood, all the stuff that you know, it affects craniofacial development. It's a certain contributor to worsening sleep disorder, breathing, behavioral sleep problems. It has an impact on dental health. So children or adults who are mouth breathing, it affects the saliva pH in the mouth, more prone to dental caries, gum disease, bad breath. It can contribute to asthma, make it worse because you're taking cold, dry, unfiltered air into the lungs. It triggers a stress response because when you're mouth breathing, your breathing is going to be a little bit faster and harder and upper chest. And of course, there's a lot of communication going from the body up to the brain. And, you know, it's it's just not the right way to breathe. And it really, like some people will say, like I had a meeting with somebody last week and he said, he said, I am a great believer that human beings, that breathing sorts itself out. And I said, doctor, I said, that doesn't happen. You know, we have to think of the underlying behavior here. If you have a child or an adult who is doing something over a period of time, and it doesn't have to be all that long, it could be five or six months, that can be enough that that individual then develops a poor breathing pattern and that can continue for a long time. And see, the thing is, <clears throat> because there's so little attention on it, you know, it comes back to what you said earlier on there, that why do we have to say this to, to people right. coming in? Like something so obvious, like what's in the mouth? You know, our teeth, our tongue, our hard palate, soft palate, throat, you can say the gums, and none of those things do anything for breathing. You know, so we can, by just looking inside the mouth, you can deduce what exactly does the mouth do. You know, it's for eating, for drinking, for speaking, and <clears throat> for social bonding. It's certainly not for breathing. If it was, something would be in the mouth that's devoted to breathing, but there isn't. I loved, okay, that is something I actually wrote down, just even in my conversations with patients, but really healthcare providers that just seem to be so just blase about it. Like they, I even know ear, nose, throat doctors that really don't see a big deal. Like, eh, you're getting the air, whether you breathe through your nose or your mouth. I mean, I, or, you know, even just like the difference between chest breathing and diaphragm breathing. Like, I, I just don't understand why <laughs> this is such a logical thing. So when you said in the video and I wrote it down, there is no part of the mouth that deals with breathing. Name a part of the mouth that is part of the function of breathing. And I will say to patients, you know, your nose is not just a decoration. It's there for a reason. So if you're not using it, don't you think that there's going to be some adverse reactions or some changes in your quality of life? Um, and you can kind of see like, oh yeah, I guess I do need a nose and I'm not using it. Um, but what you said earlier too, I mean, it's related to you have a higher chance of sleep-related breathing disorders if you're mouth breathing. You have a higher chance of just dysregulation or uptick, upregulation and higher risk of panic attacks. And just in that high sympathetic tone, that high um, fight or flight if you're mouth breathing. And what's funny is I've been I mean, I've been saying this to my kids for years and we actually were visiting um, one of their grandmothers in the hospital 
and uh, she was actually in hospice and um, she was declining, but the nurse came in, you know, and the, and the jaw was kind of slack and uh, the nurse came in and put a chin strap on her. And one of the kids said, why are you putting a chin strap on grams? And the nurse said, because her oxygen's dropping and we want her to have as much oxygen as possible. So we need her breathing through her nose. And all the kids looked at me like, you're not crazy, mom. That matters. Nose breathing. Actually, you get more oxygen to the brain when you nose breathe. And I mean, even in hospice, they know this. They're closing the mouths. They're you know, helping these patients get as much, much oxygen as possible in the hospital. Yeah. You know, 1988, there was a researcher, Swift, and one ear, nose, and throat doctor actually talks about it, Dr. James Bartley. He's based in New Zealand. And they looked at patients who were after having jaw surgery. And because of the jaw surgery, their jaws were wired shut. So they had no other choice but to breathe continuously in and out through the nose. And the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood increased by nearly 10%. Now, we have to think about, it's not just about the volume of air that we bring into our lungs, because that would be too easy. We really have to be thinking about, is there a way to breathe to optimize oxygen transfer from the lungs to the blood? And nose breathing improves that. And is there a way to breathe to improve our blood circulation and optimize oxygen delivery from the blood to the tissues? And nose breathing improves that, especially when you do physical exercise with your mouth closed. So there are simple breathing exercises that you can gently soften and slow down your breathing. And ironically with breathing, less is more. And it's not that you have to go throughout your entire day breathing less air, but anybody can practice this for, your, for themselves. And this is what got me into breathing. I always had cold hands, cold feet. I had poor concentration. And I remember sitting down after reading about breathing that it should be in and out through the nose. Our breathing should be light. It should be slow. It should be primarily driven by the diaphragm. And I practiced as I sat there, gently softening and slowing down my breathing to the point of air hunger. And I did it for about three minutes of a tolerable air hunger. And I noticed that the temperature of my hands increased. There was increased water saliva in the mouth. Now that was enough to show me that there was a direct connection. But what was more, I was doing, by breathing less air, I was doing the opposite to what is commonly espoused out there. Because normally when people are told if they are stressed, they are told to take a deep breath. And this is followed by taking a big breath. So I think there's a lot of misinformation. I think, you know, the fundamentals of breathing, there's nothing left of field about breathing. People still have this idea. There's a few things that people think about breathing. They think that their breathing is good. They don't have to think about it. So the doctor who is not placing any attention on breathing, well, that doctor is likely not a mouth breather. Because if that doctor was a mouth breather, that doctor would be only too well how they are waking up with a dry mouth in the morning, how they've got an increased risk of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea, how it can impact their concentration, their focus, but also their stress levels. Because again, you know, these are the functions, when we think about breathing, we have to think that how we breathe affect all of the major functions or disciplines of medicine and health. Our respiration, our sleep, our mental health, and our dental health. And it's very, very important. So I do think it, it's, it absolutely needs some awareness and a conversation needs to be had. How is your breathing? Oh my gosh, absolutely. And what you just said, there is still this um, stigma that breath work or you hear breath work and different things. It's very left field, very not, not mainstream. And something as basic as the breathing of a human being should be so mainstream. And part of conversation when you go visit your primary care physician or, and I believe the dentist, you know, we're quickly becoming the primary care of the airway um, with what we're seeing, the, like the craniofacial uh, effects of poor breathing. Um, our imaging shows us so much that it's insane not to have a conversation about a patient's breathing. Like you said, just even the dental, the oral environment, 
is compromised with mouth breathing, higher rates of decay, golly, gingivitis, halitosis, bad breath, all of those things. We should be having these conversations about breathing. But unfortunately, and I'm I'm glad we're having them, but unfortunately, it's usually the first time a patient's hearing it is in a dental chair. And they're like, well, wouldn't my medical doctor bring this up if it was such a problem? But like you said, Patrick, it affects so many things. And when you look at a patient's health history and I see anxiety, I see snoring, I see all the antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, high blood pressure medication, high cholesterol medication, and then I see snoring. And that opens the conversation because it does affect so many different systems. And we know that breathing for thousands and thousands of years, it helps our mental well-being and our um, just to calm us down. But it's interesting too, like you said, less is more. Uh, it's the quality of our breathing. And we are taught, take a deep breath, calm down, take a deep breath. And that is, like you said, you're going to get lightheaded if you take deep breaths. That's hyperventilation. And what a lot of people don't understand is really even the nose it's two separate organs put together so that each nostril, each side of the nose is independent. And usually it's cycling every 90 minutes. You know, it's different in everybody, but you're really only breathing through one nostril at a time. That's how little that you don't need that big gaping mouth. You don't need a lot of air. Matter of fact, you need less air. And, um, I love what you said too. You need to go low and slow, just down regulate low and slow. Um, what are some of the things that, like when you're talking to other healthcare providers and they're shocked by what you have to say? I mean, we're not taught this in dental school and not medical school. So what are, what are some of the conversations you're having? Cause I think patients intuitively, when you say this and you say, you know, a lot of the things I'm seeing in your body could be related to your sleep and your breathing. And they're like, are you kidding me? It makes sense. But healthcare providers are a little, uh, they're a tougher nut to crack. <laughs> so what are, what, what are some of the conversations you're having? Um, what, what kind of gives the light bulb moment to some of these healthcare providers? I think the whole aspect in terms of sleep is the big one. So, you know, normally I'll start off and I will ask if I'm talking to a group of people and I ask them to make a snore through their mouth and it goes like this. And then I ask them to close their mouth and try and snore through their mouth with their mouth closed. And they realize that it's, it's pretty much impossible. And then I ask them to make a sound of a snore through their nose and it goes like this. So it's quite a different sound. You've got mouth snoring and you've got no snoring. Mm -hmm. But with no snoring, I then ask the group of people I'm talking to to really soften and slow down the speed of your breathing and to have a relaxed and slow, gentle breath out. And as you're breathing in a very light and soft and gentle manner, try and snore through your nose. And people will find it's more difficult to do. Too much emphasis is placed on the anatomical aspect of breathing. And I'm not saying, of course, it's vitally important, the anatomy is, and not enough emphasis is placed on what's expected to go through that pipe. You yeah. know, if a plumber was putting in a kitchen tap or bringing, say, say a plumber is coming to your house and that plumber needs to bring the mains water from the kitchen sink to the back of the house, the plumber isn't going to arbitrarily just choose a pipe of any diameter. The plumber is going to be interested in flow. How much flow do I need to get from point A to point B? But in sleep medicine, all of the focus is on the anatomy mm -hmm. and no focus or very little focus is on flow of breathing. And what I mean by flow of breathing, I'm talking about the respiratory rate and the tidal volume to give you a minute volume. Now, if we then look at this in terms of obstructive sleep apnea, so with children, Children, the gold standard of treatment for obstructive sleep apnea is to remove the adenoids and tonsils. It's a practice that's carried out since the 1970s. The efficacy of it was really first 
investigated in 2010, a published paper in 2010 by Bader Charji that's published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. They looked at 578 children and they found that even though adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy significantly brought down the, their sleep apnea severity, only 27% of these children had their sleep apnea cured post-surgery. So 73% of these kids continued to have re residual sleep apnea post-surgery, and their average AHI was four events per hour, which is actually bordering on moderate. But we also have to bear in mind that there are other papers by Dr. Christian Gimeno, when he was either a co-author or a lead author, that if children are not taught nasal breathing, removal of the adenoids and tonsils is a short term, and there's a worsening in their sleep within three years if they continue to mouth breathe. Now, I was writing a book called The Breathing Cure, and I wanted to delve into this because I was that mouth breathing child, and it wreaks havoc on your attention span. Yes. And it wreaks havoc on your academic ability. And it's known that children who are sleepy, they have 10 times the, the risk of learning difficulties. You know, we are expecting to put our children into school and for these kids to pay attention to what the teacher is saying, but yet we're not giving them the tools to be able to, to do just that. And these kids then are getting labeled as, you know, academically, they're not intelligent. And, you know, that's a stigma. That's not a nice, especially for a growing child. Like life can be tough enough. And to, to think that you're a child in the class, that you don't have an intelligence that's that the same as your peers. And I felt that way. You know, so by switching from mouth to nose breathing, it made a remarkable difference in my sleep. But I'm going to go just one step back with this. If the sole cause of sleep disorder breathing in children was enlarged adenoids and tonsils, well, then removal of the adenoids and tonsils would cure sleep disorder breathing. It doesn't. So then we have to ask is what, what are the other factors then that are causing that 73% of children continue to have sleep apnea post-surgery? We have to think about inflammation, but mouth breathing is going to cause inflammation of the throat because moisture and moisture is sucked out of the airway. The, moist, the, the airway is drying out. The, the airway is cooling. The trauma is associated by mouth breathing, taking cold, dry, unfiltered air. You know, if, if somebody breathes quite strongly through their mouth over, over, say, one night, they wake up in the morning, they will feel it in their throat. So mouth breathing is trauma to the throat. Another aspect, of course, is craniofacial development. And a conversation needs to be had. Was the child tongue tie? What oral habits does the child have? Are they sucking their tongue? Do they have their mouth open? How is the development of the jaws where they breastfed as, as infants and as young babies? Like, and this is the big conversation because ultimately, if you think of 20% of people in the United States are taking prescription medicine for psychiatric illness, and we will never get to the bottom of psychiatric mental health problems if those individuals continue to have sleep disorder breathing. You know, and you one might say, well, is it is it obstructive sleep apnea which is feeding into the depression? Or is it depression that's feeding into obstructive sleep apnea? Well, there's a strong commonality there because symptoms cross over. People feel irritable. They have cognitive difficulty. They're feeling fatigued. They're not able to cope. And then we have to ask the question, well, say, say somebody with depression and they're going to their psychiatrist and their psychiatrist is giving medication and giving them tools to help from a mental health point of view. But let's say that person with depression has an underlying obstructive sleep apnea. Well, of course, obstructive sleep apnea is going to feed into depression. So if that person is really going to want to improve their mental health, they have to be looking at sleep, but it doesn't happen. So if there needs to be a conversation between the dental community and the medical community. Yes. Um, I, as a 50 year old man, I go to my dentist pretty often. I've only started going to my medical doctor once per year. But I go to my dentist every, you know, every six months and my dentist, if educated, is in a position to spot for the risk factors associated with sleep disorder breathing, scalloping of the tongue, a high narrow palate, overcrowding of teeth, jaws that are set back and any associated kind of inflammation that might be in the mouth, the throat, the space, etc. The dentist is able to see that in just a couple of minutes. Yeah. So, 
you know, like why why isn't the the middle aged man who is very prone to obstructive sleep apnea a high risk? Why aren't they being encouraged? You know, to to do something. So I think for children, it's really important. And I'm already just going to make one point when I think about it. Let's look at the gold standard of treatment in sleep medicine, which is the CPAP machine. Mm -hmm. It works. There's no question. Yeah, you but can blow problem, anybody's airway open with a CPAP. The, <laughs> it, it, it works, but the problem is compliance. You Absolutely. Know, if you have a compliance rate of 50%, it's hardly a success story. Can you imagine if that was in any industry? Imagine that in the, automo the automobile industry or the aircraft industry, that there was a success rate of 50%. That isn't too much higher than placebo. <laughs> I mean, it's not the best. And, and that's what I tell patients. Look, I have patients that say, you couldn't pry that out of my hands. I feel so much better on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love my CPAP, but 50% of them cannot wear it. They cannot tolerate it. Um, and they have sleep fragmentation. Granted, the CPAP is blowing past an obstruction, but they're still fragmented sleep and they're not sleeping well, or they're getting, you know, infections in the nose, uh, gastric distension, middle ear blowout. It, it's just, there's a lot. Um, and like you said, you have to look at, you remove the tonsils, you remove the adenoids. And I've, I've seen those papers as well. I mean, in almost 75% of the cases, it's not curative. So They'll say, okay, it's a piece of the puzzle, but it's not all of it. Um, and you do have to look at the flow. If something's coming in fast and furious, it's going to change collapsibility or the P-crit. So we got to slow the slow, slow the flow down, calm it down. Um, and no one's teaching this. And actually I had sent my kiddos, I, we did some Buteco training years ago when they were younger. Um, we did paces exercises. And for those of uh, those people that don't understand, um, you got to check out Patrick's videos and uh, get his books. I have them in my practice as well, but it's just really figuring out air hunger and how long you can go, inhale, exhale through your nose, hold your nose, how long can you go before you have air hunger? And man, my kids, and I did it myself. I mean, I was going to do it with them. I mean, I was like 15 seconds. And so the goal, and I was like, this is crazy. Um, and I mean, I consider, I'm, and I am a nose breather, but I must breathe really shallow and fast through my nose. So when we could get up to the higher paces, I mean, we were trying to get them up to 60 paces if we could, you know, uh, to start to see some physiological changes. And, and it was miraculous um, just how you can even uh, unblock or decongest your nose naturally. But that's, we're not talking about that. We're just talking about a tube and we're not looking at the physics of how we could get that tube to collapse less beyond anatomy because Patrick, we all, all the dentists listening, we can vouch for this. I will look at a CBCT, a cone beam, and I will see people with huge airways that still collapse and have apnea and I, and small airways that don't collapse. So anatomy, yes, if the, if the tube is bigger, you're going to have maybe a less likelihood of collapse. But it doesn't always, it's not always an indicator of um, collapsibility or symptoms in patients. So there's function. You have to look at the biochemistry and the function. Yeah, there's a few points there. Um, Danny Eckhart's classification of PAM. So PCRIT, you mentioned as the anatomical characteristic or phenotype in sleep apnea and you don't want your airway collapsing at a low suction pressure. And the next one then is arousal threshold, which is whether you're a light sleeper or a deep sleeper. And many people are so overstimulated. So you can have somebody who is a very light sleeper, they have insomnia, they may have difficulty falling asleep, or they might wake up at three o'clock in the morning and they're lying there. They're half asleep, half awake. 
They're not awake enough to get up, but they're not sleepy enough to fall back asleep. And then there's a pressure on them to fall back asleep, especially if they know they have to get up at six o'clock in the morning for work. And that very pressure to fall back asleep is going to hamper falling back asleep. It's stressful. It's an anxiousness. It's stressful. Yes. And because it was happening as well with our own clients. And I used to give the instruction, well, we need to be telling the, you know, when we're asleep and we're waking up at three o'clock in the morning, we need to tell the brain that the body is safe because the brain, all the brain wants to do is to make sure that there's no threat against the body. The brain wants to ensure that the body survives. That's the primary function of the brain. Nothing else matters. So something is causing the brain to trigger arousal at three o'clock in the morning. And that can be harder and faster breathing. And that was first identified by Stanford back in 2017. And they said, there's this part of your brain that's spying on your breath. And if you breathe fast, your brain is interpreting that the body is under threat and your brain can trigger arousal, but also to wake you from sleep. So then we need to ask the questions, well, what might be driving our faster breathing during sleep? The temperature of the room, the air quality, is the room stuffy or not? but also the person's underlying breathing patterns. Now, of course, if they stop breathing and then when they resume breathing, they may be resuming, breathe, resuming breathing with exaggerated hyperventilation and that could arouse them. So the arousal threshold is also a very, very important one because it's a non-anatomical phenotype and mandibular advancement does not help with low arousal threshold. So it should be a conversation, I think, that doctors and dentists are, are asking clients, you know, are you finding it difficult to fall asleep? Do you have overstimulation? And let's bring in some sleep hygiene there that's, you know, associated with helping to fall asleep quicker, but also what to do at three o'clock in the morning. So what we did with our own students and clients were have them play an audio, which is a 20 minute guided audio. Now, the audio is free anyway. It's up on YouTube or it's on Spotify. And because the thing about waking up at three o'clock in the morning, the best thing to do is to hand the problem over to something else. Mm -hmm. If you try and think your way to sleep, it's not going to happen. That's but so if true. you were just, if you were to play an audio and you just listen to it, now you've handed the problem over to something else. And all you have to do is follow the instruction of the audio and it helps. Now it's my own voice and it was specifically scripted. So that's one aspect. Another one is loop gain. So yes. loop gain is a phenotype that affects 30% of people with obstructive sleep apnea. And aside from anatomical compromise, it's actually the most common phenotype. Now, high loop gain indicates that the individual has a strong chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. What does that mean? Carbon dioxide is a gas that we produce in the body. And carbon dioxide is the primary driver of our breathing. So as carbon dioxide is coming in the blood back to the lungs, if we stop breathing during sleep, the carbon dioxide cannot leave the body because we've stopped breathing. That carbon dioxide will accumulate in the lungs and accumulates in the blood leaving the lungs. And when we've stopped breathing, there's an accumulation of carbon dioxide. Yes, there's a drop of oxygen. But if we have an exaggerated response to the accumulation of carbon dioxide, when we resume breathing, we resume breathing with such exaggerated ventilation. So now our carbon dioxide level goes from too high to too low. And at that point, then the brain doesn't send a signal to breathe. And when the output from the brain to breathing is reduced, the output from the brain then to the airway dilator muscles is reduced. So you have a vicious circle. So here's another thing. So high loop gain affecting 30% of the obstructive sleep apnea population, mandibular advancement device or surgery does not work with this group. So you can imagine if you're a client and you're wearing a mandibular advancement device and you're making some progress with it, but you feel you should be making better progress. Are you waking up at three o'clock in the morning or do you have difficulty falling asleep or do you have a strong chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide? Now, how might you measure that? Measure your breath toll time. So earlier on, Dr. Stacey, you spoke about the paces that we use for the kids, but we also use a measurement for adults. And that's basically the adult is sitting down for about three minutes, five minutes or so, just with normal breathing. They take a normal breath in and out through their nose. They pinch their nose, they hold their breath and they time it in seconds. How long does it take until they feel the first definite desire to breathe? 
And when they resume breathing, their breathing should be pretty normal. Somebody with high loop gain has a low breath hold time. So say, for example, you're a dentist and your patient is coming in and they're saying, well, I think there's something else going on here. Okay, sit down the patient, allow their breathing to settle, but observe their breathing. Are they breathing mouth or nose? Are they breathing high or low? Are they breathing fast or slow? Because all of that's going to feed into it. Because when you have a strong chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide, your breathing is typically going to be faster, harder, and upper chest. Measure that person's breath toll time. It's called the control pause from the buteco method or the body oxygen level test from the oxygen advantage. And if a person has a breath toll time of less than 15 seconds, it absolutely will indicate a strong chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. So it has been accepted that, you know, a, an indirect measurement of the chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide is the length of our breath toll time. And one researcher, Messino, he did investigate high loop gain and he concluded that you can identify high loop gain in obstructive sleep apnea by the length of breath toll time that the person has. People with high loop gain have a low breath toll time. So it's a very simple test. Now, just as it comes into my mind, so say, for example, we have our middle-aged person and they are breathing mouth and they're breathing up her chest. We also have to consider the role of the diaphragm. So the diaphragm breathing muscle is our main breathing muscle. And our diaphragm breathing muscle is actually mechanically linked with the upper airway dilator muscles in the throat. Mm. So if we have our mouth open and we're breathing in and out through the mouth, we are typically breathing higher. So again, this is something that I ask my own students. I ask them to look down at their chest, take the breath through their mouth, and when they breathe through their mouth, they typically breathe high. So mouth breathing is faster breathing, is harder breathing, and is higher breathing. And by virtue of having reduced recruitment of the diaphragm, the upper airway is more liable to collapse. So we shouldn't be thinking about two airways. We need to be thinking about one airway. And if a person has poor breathing patterns, it's not just the lower airway that's affected, it's also the upper airway. That is so, um, so important. Chest breathing versus diaphragm breathing. And a lot of people have, I had a patient, I was kind of walking through this with her and she looked at me like, she could, she could not figure out how to activate her diaphragm. She was beside herself. <laughs> I, and I recommended her to Buteco training. I said, look, I got this little window of time. I'm just trying to wait, you know, raise awareness. Um, you know, put your hand on your stomach and your hand on your, your other hand on your chest. Like you, you should see your hand on your stomach rising, not your hand on your chest. And a lot of us chest breathe. And the vagus nerve, my gosh, that's all innervated, all in that diaphragm. And we know the connection of the vagus nerve to, um, you know, our well-being as well, down-regulating down us. But, so, I mean, something you said, too, you've said so much. Like, I'm, I just, there's so much to unpack here. The three in the morning. Why? three in the morning. Cause man, that is huge. Two 30, three o'clock window, especially, you know, if you have to get up for work, people are freaking out because they want to go back to bed. Why three o'clock in the morning? I know that's kind of our last cycle of sleep. That can be our longest REM stage. That can be where a lot of um, heavier sleep related breathing disorders are very impactful because we have that longer REM stage of sleep. What else is happening at that three o'clock in the morning window? Why are people waking up at three o'clock, uh, potentially from that arousal threshold? And um, why why could we be breathing a little more erratically or a little hyperventilating a little bit more at three in the morning outside of sleep-related breathing disorders? Is there something else we're missing? I don't know for sure. It could be circadian rhythm. Um, and as far as I, I remember, if you were to look at Chinese medicine, it's a time of the lungs. So there could be something in that, but I haven't looked at it enough. Um, it's pretty common. And I know 
it can affect more women than men. Yes. Uh, Yes. I mean, these are conversations I'm having a lot with my female patients and even those that are going through menopause. I'm going to be 50 this year. So I too am going, hmm, uh, things are changing. And, you know, there are definitely hormonal things at play, but to the circadian rhythm, just like we get extremely tired around 2.30 during the day, you know, that siesta time that a lot of Europeans take advantage of, that 2.30 mark, um, we see kind of an uptick in our uh, awareness and uh, awakenedness at 2.30 in the morning. And actually, Benjamin Franklin wrote a book called The Twilight Hour, um, and he would do most of his writing at 2.30 in the morning. And I think he like sat in an ice bath or something like that. I don't know. That sounds awful to me. But apparently a lot of people have, they wake up with ideas and they, you know, journal and write things down to get them out of their head. But I love what you said, get it off of you, get a, get and get something that you can listen to, to help you get back to sleep. I love that. So you said you have a video. It's a 20 minute free video on YouTube. What's it called? It's a 20 minute audio. Um, it's, I'm not sure of the name of it. Yeah, I guess we should know, be watching a video at, if, <laughs> that wouldn't be helpful. <laughs> if you do, uh, if you do a search, Patrick McKeown, uh, insomnia, it will pull it up or Patrick McKeown. Yeah. Guided insomnia pro guided okay. insomnia audio. Yeah. That's super interesting. Cause even with the loop gain, what's interesting about like even CPAP and loop gain, you see changes in loop gain initially when people start on CPAP therapy. And I had learned years ago from some sleep physicians that it's not uncommon for them to develop central apnea when they start a CPAP where they just had obstructed to begin with. Then once they have this um, kind of forced airflow, the biochemistry changes and you see this sensitivity change to carbon dioxide. And then all of a sudden, like you said, the brain goes, whoa, 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 I'm not going to send the signal down to the diaphragm. You see less muscle recruitment. And now you have central apneas that kick in um, where the patient stops breathing, not because they're obstructed, but because the brain said, knock it off. You need to increase your CO2 amounts. So um, there's definitely- It's really interesting, actually. I wasn't aware of CPAP in terms of causing central apnea. But, you know, it kind of makes sense because the CPAP is actually doing the breathing for the person. And they're not you know, used to it. They're they're not. <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah. And then you'd have to ask how much breathing is the CPAP doing for the person, especially the older devices years ago? Oh, yes. They were just blowing those airways open. And I mean, we do have now they have BiPAPs and AutoPAPs that will auto titrate the, the centimeter of water pressure. Something else that was interesting to me, I came across some of my pediatric patients that had just tragic sleep. Um, They were mouth breathing. The ENT felt, you know, adenoids, tonsils weren't impressive enough. So they didn't want to do surgery. Um, And I'm like, okay, you, that you're the expert. I just know this kid is mouth breathing and I don't know what to do. So I'm sending to the ENT first. So they didn't do surgery, um, and but the apnea, and here's what was interesting too. The sleep study came back that the child had central sleep apnea, not obstructed. So then the ENT said, well, there's nothing I can do anyway. This is a central issue. However, so then they sent the child for an MRI to rule out Chiari malformations, which can induce central apnea in children. He did that. They didn't see any Chiari malformations. They do not know why this kid has central apnea. So I reached out to the sleep physician. I said, look, he's mouth breathing. The ENT doesn't think that the mouth breathing is from an obstruction. Can the mouth breathing be leading to the central apnea? The sleep physician said, I don't really know. I said, could we do you, because when you, when sleep physicians look at sleep studies, They are looking at CO2. So the gold standard for a child right now is a PSG, which is a polysomnograph. It is they go into the lab. They don't do home sleep tests on children right now because they want the end tidal CO2. They want to see the CO2 level in a child, not because they're looking for hyperventilation, 
but they're looking for hypoventilation. They're looking for diseases that would cause a decrease in ventilation in a child, like cystic fibrosis, different things like that. So I asked my sleep physicians, can you start looking at the higher levels of CO2, not just the low levels, like, or not just the high level of CO2, but look at the lower limits of CO2. How much is the CO2 dropping? Because they're usually looking at a buildup of CO2 from hypoventilation. And so they did, they said they were going to start doing that. But I mean, you have to really have conversations with your sleep physician. But I did find a paper that showed an induction of central sleep apnea in children due to hypo, hyperventilation. So you've got this whole population of kids that you do everything as a healthcare provider. They're mouth breathing. I'm sending them to the ENT. Check. Well, there's nothing we can do. Anatomically, they don't look very large um, relative to the airway size. The sleep physician says, well, we don't really see anything wrong. The study is normal because even the algorithm of how we're determining objectively a sleep-related breathing disorder is even in question right now. AHI is being questioned. We're in a weird time, Patrick, where what's really starting to happen is we're just looking at quality of life of these kids because the studies a lot of times are coming back normal, but their sleep is anything but normal. Their breathing is anything but normal. And the ENTs are like, look, we've done our part they're still mouth breathing sometimes after the tonsils and adenoids are removed because now it's a habit or they still have what you said, like a nasal congestion that we can't quite figure out because they're mouth breathing. And this is where Buteco breathing, like, why aren't we, ta why aren't we at least doing this with, with adults and, and children? With children, there's a few points if I was to make. So say, for example, a child comes in here and the child is having the mouth open and I'm thinking to myself, well, why is this child breathing through, the, through an open mouth? Is it because they have obstruction of the nose? And then I'm asking, well, is it the back of the nose? Could it be enlarged adenoids or is it the front of the nose? Could it be just rhinitis, stuffy nose? And then I have to ask, well, what about the mouth breathing habit that the kid had as, has as well? So normally what I do is, we sit down, the child and the parent, and we talk about the importance of breathing in and out through the nose. And then we do gentle breath hold exercises to help open up the nose. And if the child finds it easier to breathe through the nose after doing the gentle breath hold exercises, well, then I know at least that part of the problem is the front of the nose. I have the, wear, the child wear a little piece of paper tape during wakefulness while they're in here in the clinic. And I have them do walking with their mouth closed. And then I have them jog with their mouth closed. And if I can see the child is able to jog with their mouth closed without, without strain, without stress, then I'm pretty comfortable that that child anatomically is actually able to breathe in and out through its nose. There is no reason for that child anatomically to have the mouth open because the child is able to jog with their mouth closed. Yes, they've done the nose and blocking exercise, but the more they do that then during the day and practice exercise, their nose will work better. So a big part of changing the behavior then is that we have them wear our own tape around the mouth and it's a tape that it doesn't cover the lips. Like, so it's surrounding the mouth, bringing the lips together. And this is to address the behavior. So if, say, for example, if a child was watching television, it's often when they get distracted that the mouth hangs open. Yes, yes. But they need to have some reinforcement telling them to breathe in and out through the nose. And if a parent is doing it, the parent after a while sounds like a broken record and it generates tension in the house because all the parent seems to be doing to the child or saying to the child is breathe through your nose, breathe through your nose, close your lips, breathe through your nose. But wearing something like a device that's bring the lips together, that when the child does forget to breathe through the nose and the device opens, sorry, the mouth opens, the device gives it puts a tension there. They feel an elasticated tension, reminding them to close their lips, to breathe in and out through the nose. And this in turn then is changing the behavior. So that's one of the things that we do. Now, I'd also like to make a point that there, wa there was a recent enough study looking at mandibular advancement device and the impact of mouth breathing while wearing a mandibular advancement device. While wearing the device, 
43% of individuals while wearing the mandibular advancement device had an AHI of less than 10 events per hour. When they started using a nose breathing support, getting the lips together, breathing in and out through the nose, their AHI increased from 43% to 76%. Mm. Sorry. In other words, 76% of that population were able to lower their AHI less than 10 events per hour. Now, even with a CPAP machine, so nasal obstruction is a factor that leads to poor compliance with using a CPAP. And I know in one paper that, because it's quite understudied, but in one paper at which they looked at compliance with CPAP with nose breathing versus mouth breathing, nose breathers, 70% of the population was compliant. Mouth breathers, it was 30%. Yes. So, you know, there has to be the wider conversation about, yes, of course we want children and adults breathing in and out through their nose with tongue resting in the roof of the mouth. It helps sleep. There is no doubt anatomically, but also the other phenotypes such as arousal threshold, because when you nose breathe, you slow breathe. When you nose breathe, you have better recruitment of the diaphragm. And also with loop gain, because when you are nose breathing, both during the day and during rest, during exercise, during sleep, you're more likely to have better functional breathing patterns. So nose breathing has its place in everyday living and sleep, but it also has its place while wearing a mandibular advancement device or a CPAP machine. And for children, you know, like I've put all of the exercise for kids up for free. They're all up there on YouTube, every, every exercise. And I worked with my own little daughter. She was nine years of age at the time. And I recorded six of the exercises for children. And we said, let's put them up there because I don't think there is any reason why children should be deprived of breathing exercises that can help these kids to breathe in and out mm. through the nose. And that's why we did it. You know, so any parent who is listening, who wants to get an idea of, well, what can I teach to my child? There are simple, very, very easy exercises. Sit down your child, you know, basically your kid will be watching me teach my own little kid. And then for your child just to follow those exercises, because I think children need to hear it from a number of different angles. Just hearing it from the parent isn't enough. Watching videos can help their dentist. But if we got this into the school system, uh, that would be the big one. Yes. And I, I tell you what, um, I knew someone that worked in the school system and uh, I mean, my gosh, a lot of the behavioral issues. So when I educated them um, on mouth breathing and it's once you see it, you can't unsee it. Then you look, I mean, everywhere you look, you're like, oh my gosh, they're mouth breathing, they're mouth breathing. Um, a lot of these kids, dark circles under the eyes, poor sleep, breathing through their mouth. I mean, we have an epidemic of behavioral and health problems in kids. And we just need to start having the conversations of how's your sleep? How are they sleeping? What's their breathing like? These are very basic questions. I tell patients too, you know, I, especially men do this. You know, they they see sleep as very um, almost like a waste of time and passive. And, you know, I only need four hours of sleep and I'm good to go. And I'm like, no, you're not. So <laughs> no, you're not. But it depends what to do. Yes, yes, yeah, <laughs> you're right. And I'm like, if you live to be 90, you should sleep 30 of those 90 years. It's a third of our life. And it's very active. It's very important. It's where our memory comes from and our healing comes from and in children growth comes from. So if you want to be your best self and you live to be 90, you should have been sleeping 30 of those 90 years. So at least 60 of them are great. You know, if you sleep less. I mean, really parents need to understand, you know, sleep hygiene is so important. Um, how many hours that children should be sleeping a night is it's, it's a lot, it's a lot because they're growing and they're, and they're developing. Um, so people can find, I love that you made these videos for kids. Gosh, thank you, Patrick. So they can just go into YouTube, I guess, and punch in your name. I'm going to have links um, where people can find, you know, how to reach out to you and learn more from you. But, um, I guess they can just punch in your name and children or like just children's videos and Patrick McKeown. 
Yes, that will pull it up. It's on okay. our website as well, um, butecoclinic.com. Okay. And we have free apps. One app is called Buteco Clinic, which is all of the exercise for kids. And then we have a very detailed app called Oxygen Advantage. And that also includes the exercise for children. So so a number of ways to, to get. But I suppose if a parent just wants to find out the exercise straight away, go in on YouTube, put in Patrick McKeown, Children's Breathing Exercises, and uh, you'll see a suite of exercises. There's only about five or six of them. Well, I would like to end this podcast by saying, hey, everybody, close your mouth. You need to get some of Patrick's books um, and we'll have links and you go to his website, check him out. This is so important. Um, and we could talk for hours about this because it needs to be discussed. And I thank you so much for um, for speaking with us today, talking with us today, because um, I know you're a busy man and to set aside this time, I just, we very much appreciate you, Patrick. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much, Dr. Stacy. Uh, well, you ain't getting off here scot free. I'm still asking my three questions. <laughs> He's like, "What are you gonna throw me? What kind of questions are you gonna throw my way?" Okay, these should be pretty simple. I just like people. I just like to get to know people a little bit more. Um, what is your morning routine? Yeah, good question, Ashley. Um, so I get up at about six o'clock normally, and I'll have a coffee. And then what I do is I go to that machine in the corner, cross trainer. So basically this is, this is our, where this is our work room. So we oh, have, Oh, I like it. We have Good. our own equipment. Are um, you at work? Yeah, this is my work. <laughs> that, okay. So, you guys, those that can't see this, go to the YouTube channel, check us out on YouTube. This is impressive. What is this? A break room for your team? So it's also a training room. So it's got a whiteboard and it's got audio visual and it's got plenty of paces exercise. So it's 17 meters long by seven meters wide. So it's a pretty big room. So this is where we can have children jogging. If I want to see if a child is able to breathe through their nose, I have them jog up and down the room. This is perfect. It's a nice it. long, it's like a, mm. a long room, a long narrow room with a lot exercise equipment yes. in there what's that yep. is there a bar over there what is that like a breakfast bar oh this here is the kitchen but that's for staff so oh, yeah so, so nice. this is basically for staff and geez yeah. i don't want my team to watch this because they're gonna get really <laughs> jealous this is oh, nice. we have a sauna around the corner oh, <laughs> so, yeah so we have about 12 staff here so kind of our offices are over there and um yeah my house is actually next door so i don't have too far to travel yeah, no rush hour for you. No, no, and it's good <laughs> because I spend enough anyway do with international travel. So it's really nice that I don't have to travel then at home. But yeah, when I get up, I normally, I get a coffee and I get onto that machine and I have to be on that machine for 30 minutes every day. That for me is the most important part of the day because it was for too long that I was getting too immersed in work. And what I would do then is sacrifice my own physical exercise. And there's a time that you say, listen, it's time that you have to give yourself some attention. So that's my routine. Now, of course, my mouth is closed. And I also do it with my attention dispersed throughout the body. In other words, I want to make my physical exercise as a means of holding my attention on my breathing and in the body so that it helps to quieten taut activity. And that's my preparation. That is amazing. And I needed to hear that as well. And in as I approach midlife, um, I'm definitely considering, you know, what's important. And uh, I think sometimes we just push things aside, including self-care. And we can't be good for anybody if we're not optimal ourselves. So that's excellent. I'm glad, I'm glad we talked about that. I'm glad you showed me that because now I'm going to rethink some things for myself. Okay, second question. Are you more of an introvert or an extrovert? I'm very much an introvert. So am and... I. People assume I'm an extrovert because I speak. And I bet people assume that about you because you're such a international speaker. But I bet you have to recharge. Yes, because... big time. Big so time. Again, and also where I live. If you were to do a Google map of where I live, you'll see that I literally live in the middle of nowhere. 
and an extrovert would not live in the middle of nowhere. I do <laughs> because it's it's a really important place that I can recharge. And I do find tiring, uh, talking is quite tiring. And that's why when somebody tells me that they, they can get by with four hours of sleep per day, well, I would agree with you. You might be getting by, but you're not necessarily productive with that. So I agree. So, yeah. Good point. That's, uh, yeah. it's so funny. Introverts are deep thinkers as well. You know, it's an introvert is somebody who likes their own space and they tease things out and they're less, less, less of a risk taker. A lot of positive things about introverts. They don't necessarily get rewarded in society. 75% of leadership positions are filled with extroverts because extroverts are the ones that will walk the room, shake hands with everybody, make friends with everybody. You know, so there's really an important role for introverts as well. It and takes all of us to make the world go totally, round. Absolutely. And yes. it's funny because people will say, you know, I'll go speak or, and they'll say, okay, there's an after party and everybody's getting drinks. I'm like, I'm going back to lay down in my hotel room because I'm exhausted from this now because I, I love to be, I do like to be alone. And I do think, um, and like you said, we're deep thinkers and you need those people too. But like you said, cause two of my children are more introverted. One of my children are extroverted and and they get judged. My extra, my introverted children get called like, oh, they're just really shy and they're this and they're that. And it's almost like people feel like they have to fix you if you're an introvert. And it's not something to be fixed. It's who we are. And you can no more tell an introvert to be an extrovert any more than you could tell an extrovert to be an introvert. It's, it's in your DNA. It's who you are. Um, that's great from a fellow introvert to another introvert. And then what was your favorite game to play as a kid? Um, yeah, as children, we were growing up in the outdoors, you know, this is 1973 when I was born. So I remember having a go-kart and we spent hours and hours and hours and it was the most unreliable thing you could ever imagine. It was a hand-built thing and the wheels would be falling off. You wouldn't put a child into it today. You certainly would. You'd have a seatbelt on. You'd have a crash helmet. And of course, we had none of those things. So yeah, it's and so it's funny. Still here. It's <laughs> funny. I'm a 1974 person, so my, you know, we would be like in the back seat of the station wagon, asking my dad to make really tight. Like he would be. We didn't wear seatbelts. I mean, we would be flying all over the back seat of the. The I don't know how we're alive, and it it's like the stuff we did as kids. It's crazy, and then. I am such a like, man, if I could put my kids in a bubble, I'm so nervous about them getting hurt. And I'm like, how did my parents even do it? Because they didn't know where we were. They had, I, I just would show up for dinner. They had no idea where I was all afternoon or all day. There was there was no app to locate your kids. You're, that's so funny. Your wheels are falling off in your go-kart. I can totally see that. That's so great. Well, thanks, Patrick. Thanks for um, spending some time with us and educating us that the nose matters and breathing matters. And it's um, how we do it. And the functionality of it is so important. So thanks for being here with us today. For sure. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Dr. Stacey. Thank you, Patrick. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.